just told a man to his pin to me. Okay. Can you rise, please, and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item on our agenda, the minutes from October 10th, 2012. I move they be accepted as printed. Just have one name correction on page three. Page. Uh, Where's that? Um, it's under other business. Other business, third line. Joe should be Jim. Yeah. I called him Joe today already, so. <laughs> okay. Any other corrections? Okay, all in favor? Should be five abstaining. Two. So it's five two on the vote. Two abstentions. Uh, next item on the agenda are the warrants. And Jason, we'll start with you. None. Greg? I have two questions on page eight. Uh, the first item on People's United Bank, all the way at the bottom, 302470, Ben 112 PM. Just, w just wondering. Yeah, what that's is. the Federal Highway Administration payment. It's it's our FEMA payment from FHWA for the work done underneath the bridges. Okay. The federal aid bridges that we in turn paid to Peoples to reduce the uh, amount of the line of credit. Gotcha. Okay. So. We get this correct. This is the money we received from the federal government, and we paid back that much toward the line of credit? Yes. Okay. And then on page 10, this is just my education, the last line, the third quarter marriage return. I'm kind of curious what that is. <laughs> <laughs> we get a portion of the, the payment of marriage licenses okay. back from the treasurer's office at every quarter. So we pay it to the state and we get this yes. license to pay to the and this, state and this, we get the money This back. began when we, we took over, when we collected the fees, this would normally have gone to the town clerk. Gotcha. Now it comes to us. Oh, okay. Very good. That's all I have. Well, this is actually the portion we sent to the treasurer. I mean, it's I'm sorry. Oh, so, yeah, so this is the yes. stuff we're paying. Yes, right? thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Greg? That's all I have. Chris? No, sir. Justin? No. Greg? Good. I'm good. Uh, I got a couple, Stuart. Um, just on the first page, we have a rental there, Anderson Equipment. Do we know what that, that $3,780 was for? What did we rent there? Uh, unfortunately, I, d I don't have that one right off the top of my head, okay. Gerald. Uh, that is a highway department rental. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm at a loss okay. to tell you what it was. Uh, on page three, and you've probably covered this before, but it just escaped me. Next to the last item, the County of Bennington. We have two payments, uh, one to North Bennington, one to the county. Uh, yes. What are those? That's the county tax. Uh, we, because North Bennington is part of the town and pays into our general fund, we pay North Bennington and Bennington's county tax. Okay. Is this a one-time payment? Uh, actually, um, this is not. This would be, it's twice that. I think twice, we're okay. And a half years. So this is when they send us their budget? Yep. This is yeah, what this is what the payment is. Seventy some odd thousand dollars a year. That is high as okay. eighty thousand dollars a year that we pay to county taxes. Okay. And I guess Greg or, yeah, Greg asked my other question. Okay. Uh, once. Next item, citizen. John, you want to come forward now? Yes. You want citizens to talk, please. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is John Broderick. I'm the Director of Regional Affordable Housing Corporation, RAC. Um, I wanted to come and invite members of the Select Board and members of the public to our ribbon cutting ceremony for our recently opened Rory and Branch Apartments development. Um, you may have seen the construction taking place on Benmont Avenue. We restored three buildings that were built in 1865 uh, for, um, into 12 units of, of housing. Beautiful renovation. I think it really provided a boost to the block and 14 new apartments and seven duplex buildings on North Branch Street. Governor Shumlin's coming down for the ribbon cutting this week. Um, it's Thursday at 1.30 at North Branch Street. 
I um, want to thank members of the select board for your help and support through this effort. Um, took 10 months to get everything done. Took another year before that to really line up all the financing. Part of the financing comes through town, set, uh, federal funds that are administered, and the town was technically the applicant on it, so really appreciate that. And want to thank Stuart and um, the whole staff uh, of the uh, the town at the town office for being so supportive and helpful all the way through the process. Um, there is no more workforce housing than this. This is workforce housing. Uh, we do not have any project-based rental assistance, so there's no rental subsidies that go with the units. There are a few people who have Section 8 vouchers that they can use to pay any landlord, and we certainly accept that, but we have people who work at Kmart, Price Chopper, Hannaford, Plasan, uh, the State Highway Department, UCS, several nursing homes. Um, we have three veterans who served their country, two in combat. Um, so we're really proud about people that um, people that are living in these apartments. Um, I don't think there was anyone that had an out-of-state address. I know that's one of the criticisms sometimes that people move here to get great new housing. I don't think there was anyone that on their application that didn't have a local address. Um, so I think we've done a, a really good job with it. Um, Really pleased with the way the buildings came out. Uh, the contractor was Naylor and Breen out of Brandon, but the largest of the subcontracts were Hayden Plumbing and Heating, Bennington, two, second generation Bennington Company, and Hathaway Electric that's based right at the bottom of Harwood Hill over there. Um, also want to thank them. Also want to thank Bennington House of Tile for providing us flooring, for um, Greenbergs and RJ <coughs> Miles and Curtis Lumber and all the local companies that provided um, provided materials and labor and subcontract support for the development. So, once again, thanks everyone. Hope to get to see you on Monday or Thursday. John, please, uh, just I won't be it will be ten as I told you. Just uh, apologize to the Governor. You'll understand. Uh, he's got me doing other things. <laughs> so he, he didn't he didn't, he didn't coordinate his schedule with me before he decided to come down here. Uh, are you going to be able to attend, Chair? I will. Sharon will represent me, and any other board members can go. Obviously. So, great. Thanks, John. Looks good. Okay, thanks. Any other citizens out there I'd like to speak to the board? Okay, if not, the next item on the agenda is community group presentation. Michael, you want to come up? I'd love to start. Folks might remember about six months ago, I guess, the Council of Development was here. About and we six months, yeah. had a series of town forums and meetings, and out of that came uh, based on our own citizens' requests, four different topics, I believe. They wanted us to over. <coughs> And this will be the first to the public presentation of two of those uh, committees tonight. Is that right, Mike? That's exactly right. We're going to okay, do two Mike. tonight and two at the next meeting. I'll turn it over to you, pleasure. Mike. Uh, yeah, well, you all remember the, um, about six months ago, at, at, um, well, the March and April, uh, the Vermont Council on Rural Development at the leadership of Paul Costello came down. And about 400 Bennington residents all participated in this. Uh, I know a lot of you were at the different meetings. And the uh, report and action plan was created in June. There's copies of that still at the town offices, I'm sure, Stu, right? <laughs> we got a lot of those. <laughs> but if anybody's interested, it does list everybody that participated in it and all the other people involved. And it resulted in four priority projects. The first was to advance the community center and improve a recreation uh, center that's headed by Joan Ehrenhaus. Develop a Bennington vision statement, advance community communications, and a positive town image that's headed by Michael Harrington. Collaborate, collaborate to address poverty and build a poverty work group that's headed by Charlie Gingo and make downtown Bennington the destination to build a new town green that's headed by John Shanahan. These groups have met and made real progress. Tonight we're gonna to hear two presentations, one from Michael Harrington with the Vision and Community uh, Communications Group and uh, the other by Charlie Gingo uh, on the poverty issues. Uh, I think Michael, you're up first. Great, please. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Uh, in talking with the group, and we had our facilitators meeting uh, the other day, it, the idea was just to give you a little bit of background about where these groups are at. Uh, as mentioned, the vision, image, and communication group that's been meeting, we meet about uh, once a month. It's usually on a Tuesday evening, anywhere around 5 to 6 o'clock in the evening. And looking at 
in many ways what could be considered as projects that could go on a lifetime if we always wanted to focus on vision or our image that we should be constantly trying to uh, boost our image and enhance our image and obviously communication and better our communication between different groups. So what we've asked the groups to do is really identify one project in each one of those that they want to take on and they want to own. Uh, and so starting with vision, they've begun conversations in each one of these subject areas, but really the focus at this point has been around vision. And so uh, the group that uh, has been meeting, there's anywhere between eight and 12 of us that meet on a regular basis. I believe the original mailing list is somewhere around 20 people. Uh, so, but we have some consistent people, and most recently for the past two meetings, we've had a handful of students that have been attending as well. So that's, From where, Mike? Uh, Highland Hall School and also the middle school and a recent graduate of the high school. Uh, and so in the vision group, the focus has really been recognizing that this group of eight people, um, you know, it's not really up to them to develop the vision for our community and expect that everybody else is just going to jump on board with that. But what they've been doing is researching a lot of different visions, looking at visions that have come through different documents we've had, like the town plan, but also different communities and, and their visions as well. Uh, and so focusing on that, they've begun creating uh, a number of different vision statements, uh, probably anywhere around uh, three to maybe four by the time we're done, uh, that they can then begin to look to bring to public forums and such like that to get feedback from people. Uh, so, but they've really been saying, you know, I can tell you our last meeting was uh, last week and, and really got into some good dialogue and conversation around, well, well, what is it? You know, is the idea that our vision should just be, um, you know, there was some healthy debate between whether it's things that we currently have that we want to continue or are they new things that we want us uh, and the community to focus on as a community. Uh, and so that's, they've been kind of working through a lot of those different um, questions that they've had uh, about the vision for our, our community and how do we get others engaged. So that's where we're at with the vision piece. The image uh, piece has really been around how do we research and identify where maybe that this negative perception, and many of you probably heard this when we had Dr. Mullen here as well, that we're our own worst enemy because we know all our dirty laundry, and so people from the outside certainly view us much better sometimes than we view ourselves, and that actually came out in some of the, the uh, focus group discussion that we had around image. Uh, so the conversation has been, where, what are the areas we that we do very well in those assets and how do we promote those more so people know the good things that are going on and then maybe where are some of the challenges that we're currently facing and, and what are some some possible solutions for those and and so the group and I've you know they really want to take on this vision image and communication in whole and I've um, we've had to have a lot of different conversations about okay but what is the what is the focus we're going to take <coughs> in this group because we could just be a group that lasts forever um, you know always battling these things and you'll probably hear that from from Charlie as well you know poverty will always be an issue and he's not necessarily looking for the silver bullet uh, and so you know in, in the image piece, really saying what are the, what's one thing we could do as a group to really put our stamp on to say this is how we suggest to improve the image. Uh, and communication, we haven't necessarily gotten there yet, but if you read through the, um, the community book that, uh, that Mike Brady just held up, uh, one of the things in there is talk about a community calendar and some of these other initiatives. And so we've been talking about uh, what will be that project that this group will work on when they get to uh, the communication conversation. So that's kind of the group in a nutshell. Like I said, they meet once a month on Tuesdays typically. Uh, and we have anywhere from you know as few as five to as many as, as 12 people or so uh, in, in looking at these three different areas. And One of the commitments that uh Paul Costello made before he left here is that we would still be getting assistance from outside sources uh, to assist us in, in the different areas we're tackling. Have they provided any, any issues or anything that will assist you in the vision, the image, or the communication? I would say at this point, no, but we also haven't requested it necessarily either. Um, so uh, I think if just in my conversations with Paul, if there was something that came up that we really felt we needed a, a, a hand with, um, he would certainly help. But nothing, nothing recently that I can really okay. put a finger on. Other board members? 
Yeah, thank you, Martin. Yeah, not a problem. How many people you say were in the group? Uh, anywhere from Functional. five to twelve. Five to the, 12. the initial group, I think, the mailing list had anywhere from fifteen to twenty people. Right. Uh, when I created the distribution list. So, but these are typically routine people that come. Uh, you know, I think the challenge in this group is that they're very obscure topics. Right. Um, you know, the, they're very abstract, and there's, uh, and I think that uh, is a challenge uh, in some sense to really figure out, okay, how do you take kind of this abstract idea of vision or image and put something quantitative sure. and qualitative on it. So uh, that's our biggest challenge. To ever involve, like invite a specific party in or something mm -hmm. like that to, to for perspective or for, cause I think that's the plan. You know, yeah. I think what this group has talked about, let's take vision for example, they've wanted to uh, come up with some, some platforms, I guess, you know, some, some kind of really rough drafts that then we could say, how do we get the school system involved, or how do we uh, pull in the select board, or how do we have a, maybe there's some forums, uh, open community forums to get some feedback on that. So I think they wanted to have at least a, a working draft uh, and then be able to to open it up to the public. I say that, I mean, all of our meetings are open to the public, mm -hmm. uh, and they we do a mailing with an agenda for each meeting, um, you know. But certainly, other people who are interested uh, can certainly contact me, uh, and I'll, I'll put them on the mailing list. Um, you know, so I, in that sense, uh, for example, we did have uh, we do have a rep uh, from uh, the SVSU. Uh, we do have the students that were there. We have a local uh, small business uh, in town that's on that. Uh, and we also have, we have a couple small businesses. We have some representation from the chamber and uh, we also have a couple retired people uh, with some educational background and, and stuff. So uh, it's kind of a broad mix of, of participants. Thank you. Tell me out a minute, I just, it just dawned on me something. When Dr. Mullins was here, he used a phrase, and I can't remember what it was. Those of you who were there might remember, but where we were, we should look out and see, we want to be like some other town. What was that term you used? Anybody remember? Benchmarking, maybe? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll go through the tape again. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I guess my question was, whatever that was, um, if we had decided that, and he threw Saratoga, I think, as one of the towns he was mentioning. But let's say we picked uh, Saratoga, for example, um, that we thought that's where we want to strive for because of all the activities they've got going there and things. Would you ever think of going to that town, see what their vision is, to kind of compare it to see if... Uh, did we miss the boat by picking that town, or, or are we okay? Um, we have looked at a couple of visions from other communities. So we did try to find some communities. Uh, I looked at, in the beginning, we, I looked at Barrie, Vermont, and mm -hmm. some other ones that have been brought up. I don't think it's outside the realm to say if we identify something that has an attribute. You know, I think it's going to be very hard for, for us to say we want to be wholly like somebody else. I think the best benchmarking that I've seen is what are the things we're struggling with and let's find a community that's had those same struggles and has overcome them. And so you're benchmarking against certain attributes. You're not necessarily trying to recreate a mirror like of a different community. Uh, so that's, I mean, but I think, I think the idea of going and visiting and seeing it firsthand uh, would be a great uh, opportunity for this group. Uh, and I think they should do that once they get to the point where they have some of that um, uh, nailed down in terms of, I think at this point they're sitting there going, well, what are those attributes? I mean, many of them have listed things like recreation and, uh, and natural beauty. Um, but as a vision, that's a great vision, but we don't necessarily have control over our natural beauty. So uh, I think really trying to get ourselves in a mind frame of what are those things that we can, we can actually impact uh, and change, uh, and, and, and how do we capitalize on some of the ones that we, we don't necessarily have control over, but we certainly could capitalize on those. So I mean, I'm, I think the group is certainly open to any feedback and would love more participation. Um, but you know they're also uh, moving along and they've been putting in a lot of time, so uh, my hat's off to them. Let me throw one at you, Mike, yeah. and if your if your group will take it up. Uh, I recently spent some time out in Omaha, Nebraska, and I came back. I think I talked to Stuart about it. Extremely progressive city, much larger, obviously, than we are. But there was growth going over. There's businesses coming in. There was uh, expanding recreation. I mean, bicycle things we've been talking about. Uh, if your group was interested, why don't we write them and just ask them what their vision is? I'd be curious to see uh, what it was, because I saw firsthand what's going on there. It's just remarkable what's, what's happening out there. Unemployment very low and uh, 
apparently jobs are, are good, housing is, is good. I'm just curious what their vision would be. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I think that's a great idea. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll bring it back to the group and maybe, you know, if you have other thoughts on communities that you think would be good ones for us to, I think what I see is this group is it's, it's not all the same players that have always been involved in a lot of the other things. And so, um, and I say things, but you know, other community projects and things that we've done. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great to hear the fresh voice, but they could always use some guidance in terms of, you know, if we were gonna benchmark, what do you hear as leaders of the community that are communities that, are, like Joe mentioned, that are overcoming or, um, you know, um, doing very well? Uh, in the economy today. So, you know, we'll take any feedback and, and take that and, and look into it for sure. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you. Charlie, you next? Thank you. The uh, poverty work group is, uh, is a very interesting work group. It was, uh, the, the topic itself was the most controversial to get on the agenda for the community visit. And then during the visits, it generated huge volumes of people attending the various sessions on the, the broad issue of poverty. Um, one of the things that happened at the community visits is the poverty work group became a repository for lots of different kinds of issues. And you'll hear about some of those in what I'll present to you this evening. Um, one of the things that I said to the folks after Mike had invited me to facilitate the, uh, the, the work group, the first work group uh, meeting took place in June because the community visits were March, April, May. And we had about 35, 38 people attend that first group. And that's, that group has stayed very committed. And some others have joined the uh, group also. Um, but one of the things that I said at that first meeting is we're not here to solve poverty. It's, it's not going to happen. But rather to look at, in, in essence, two kinds of things. One is to make an effort to address some of the issues that people in poverty deal with every day. And, and secondly, really to take a look at ways that we as a, we as a community can come together to be a stronger community to pull together people from different backgrounds, different age groups, different income levels, et cetera, and to, to make it a better place. Because when you address those kinds of community issues, you address it for everybody who lives here, people who aren't in, and people who do live in poverty. The work group itself is simply too large to have as one group. Again, we've got about 35 people who are members of the poverty work group. And uh, we've got people from the faith community. We've got parents. We've got educators. We've got people who live in poverty on our committee. We've got uh, folks from state agencies, from nonprofit organizations. It's a, it's a very interesting mix of people who attend the what we call the large poverty work group. What we did at the very first meeting is we broke down the work that got generated by during the community visits and the, the, the <coughs> voting that took place. We broke it into seven subcommittees. And that's where the the week to week work is actually getting done. The large group meets every two months. The the subcommittees some are meeting weekly, bi weekly, and a couple of them are meeting on a monthly basis. So let me tell you what those subcommittees are. And just to do a quick highlight of a couple things that they're working on at this point. I'll do them in alphabetic order. Uh, the first is collaboration. And the kinds of things that this group uh, are looking at are, they're working on a resource guide to services in Bennington County um, that would be both web-based and hard copy-based. Some people have computers, some people do not. They've been working closely with Vermont 211, the statewide information and referral system, and the Agency of Human Services, which has a number of databases that it can tap into, uh, to use those as the base of support for the work that ends up getting done. And they're working right now also on how to best advertise, uh, distribute, and keep updated 
that resource guide. So this is the first thing that they decided, let's, let's do something, let's work on something fairly concrete. And this is what the collaboration subcommittee has started with. The second is a community fund of some sort, again, generated in the, uh, in the community visit. This group has been identifying existing local funds, how to access them, and who do they serve. There are a number of organizations in the community that have pools of dollars. And some people know about a lot of them. Some people don't know about many of them. What, they're, what this committee is trying to do is Let's, let's see if we can identify who all of them are, and let's see who they serve, and how do you access those dollars. The second thing that's happening actually this week is the subcommittee is going to be meeting with the Vermont Community Foundation and folks from the Fund for North Bennington to really look at the process about a step, potentially establishing a fund. How, what do you do? What are some of the pitfalls to avoid? What can you do? if you're really trying to establish a Bennington community fund. So to do the groundwork before you go out and try to raise dollars. What, what is it? Who do we serve? Those kinds of things have to get addressed first. And then potentially, if this comes to pass, they would look at the possibility of supporting some of the work that's going on in some of the subcommittees and possibly other places in the community too. The uh, third group, the third subcommittee is an education subcommittee and their focus is very, very narrow at this point. What they're doing is they're pulling together representatives from various groups that do after school programming and activities uh, to see what's out there, to see how those groups might be better able to share resources and to try to figure out how best to catalog and organize that information. They've identified a huge issue already in various conversations with groups that do after school stuff, and that is after school transportation. It's a very significant issue that's been identified in a number of the groups. Uh, it, if there were better after school transportation we might be able to allow students to get some of the extra help they need without worrying about how they're going to get home. Or parents worrying about how they're going to go get their kids. Uh, likewise, for some of the uh, activity, the after school activities, it's the same issue. I'd like my kid to go, but I can't pick them up. I'd like my kid to go, but I don't have a car. Uh, so one of the things that the group has done very concretely is they've met with folks from Green Mountain Express to look at ways that the local bus system might be able to add an extra run or two and to do it at as low cost as possible. Aren't they doing that now, Charlie, in some of the after school programs? There is, for some of the programs at the high school, there is transportation after school, but there are other programs that are going on also, Joe, and transportation is an issue for them. Yeah, I heard the Green Mountain's working well with uh, uh, Bob Marine with this cadet program they've got going where they're picking the kids yes. up and bringing them around and yeah. doing that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. The uh, fourth work group is uh, focused on expanding dental care. Uh, and this group is working closely with Greater Bennington Interfaith Community Services. The Greater Bennington Interfaith Community Services, as you know, they run the Bennington Free Clinic the kitchen cupboard over on Gage Street, and also the food and fuel fund. And a disclaimer, I'm on that board also. I sit on the board of the Interfaith Community Services. Four major things are being looked at. Uh, there are discussions going on right now with community partners about setting up a freestanding dental clinic. Uh, we're working with the Bennington Free Clinic about expanding their dental services and referral services. And we're also looking at the possibility of vouchers for adults uh, who might need remedial care. If you want to get a tooth pulled, there's a system in place to do that. But if you want to get some basic dental care, you need a cavity filled or you want a cleaning, there's no system in place to do that uh, in, in the community. So that's something that we're looking at 
we're working with the free clinic to see if we can, uh, how can we better do that through the clinic. We're also looking at how to better support the dental programs that one that's operating in the elementary schools that Mike is involved in, and one that's recently closed in the high school uh, because it's difficult to find hygienists to do the work in the high schools. So we're looking at ways, how do we support that, both as a community and potentially financially. And lastly, in a very broad sense, we're just exploring, uh, is there a way to do a community-based dental health approach? Uh, one of the things that we did at the kitchen cupboard, for example, is in the 18 or so months that we've been open, we've given out over 10,000 toothbrushes. Is there, some, is there some way? I don't know what that's going to look like, but that's one of the things that the dental subcommittee is looking at. The fifth subcommittee is focused on housing, and they are looking at five priority areas. Teen housing, a year-round emergency shelter, more subsidized and affordable housing. We're very pleased with what John was talking about earlier, John Brado was talking about earlier, but there's a need for more. Uh, creating a landlord-tenant association, and doing more education in the public setting about a, a, a couple things that I'll mention here briefly. The um, Housing Subcommittee has been regularly attending the monthly meetings of the Bennington Housing Authority. And they are really encouraging the local housing authority to really offer services to the residents. We, we are a housing authority that's way behind everybody else in the state in what they provide to their tenants. And this is one of the things that the work group is focusing on. Also about consistent policy. Well, let's clarify, provide. Provide in services or provide in assistance or what are we? What Providing certain, that the housing authority itself would provide certain kinds of services. What that would look like, it depends housing authority to housing authority around the state. But that's something that they're really encouraging them to do. To have programming on site that could be modeled on what other some other housing authorities are doing around the state. Do you have any examples of things going on around the state? I don't have any off the top of okay. my head. The committee definitely does because this is something I know that they've been talking about with the local the local housing authority. Have they looked at Applegate? Applegate is a great example uh, of uh, organization that really has developed mm -hmm. in uh, an incredible network of. I want to call it supportive housing issues. Uh, with, you know, it might be cooking together or cooking classes. Mm -hmm. It might be various kinds of having speakers come in to talk about health kinds of issues, I mean, whatever it might be. Lots of different kinds of things are out there. And they have after school programs. And they have after school kids. programs too. Um, one of the things that the Housing Authority asked the committee to do is to develop a survey to give to Willowbrook, Willow, Willowbrook residents about living in Willowbrook. And that's, I'm not sure when or if that's begun. Uh, I know that the, the survey itself is close to completion if it's not been completed yet. And we were, we'll find that out next month where that thing stands. Charlie, they have a tenants association that I'm sure would be happy to sit down with you guys. That would be great. Um, <coughs> One of the things that the uh, Housing Committee has also done is they've contacted Legal Aid to come in to do a uh, presentation on tenants' rights in federally funded housing projects, to do a second one on general, for the general public on tenants' rights, and to do a third one on landlord rights. And then to use that as the possibility of coming up with a landlord-tenant association. There's some who say landlords don't have any rights. Some say that, but it's not true. <laughs> um, the other thing that uh, the committee is doing is trying to stay abreast of some of the different kinds of things going on in the community. One, for example, uh, in, in, um, in specific is staying on top of what's going on with the Bennington Coalition for the Homeless efforts to set up a year-round emergency shelter. And that's something, again, they're just trying to keep their hands on a lot of pulses that are going on in the community. 
And they've been doing some other, they've been doing research on what some other housing authorities are doing around the state, just to have a better sense of what might be available for folks who live here. The uh, sixth group is focused on mentoring. And usually when we think about mentoring, we think about one-on-one, -on -one, an adult working with a child, a big brother, big sister kind of relationship, the big brother working with the little brother. <coughs> this group's taking a very different approach. They're looking at mentoring, if you will, a neighborhood. Um, they're, what they're trying to do is uh, identify, they identified 15 different possibilities in Bennington where it could be a trailer park, it could be an apartment complex, it could be a small neighborhood that looks at itself as a neighborhood. It might have 25 to 30 housing units, people who own, people who rent, whatever it might be. And uh, so looking at a specific geographic area to come in with some trained volunteers, possibly some staff, and work with the people who live there to help them identify what issues they would like to see addressed in their community, that neighborhood, but to really have the people who live there do the work. To first identify and then to say, we want to focus on, and there are things like, um, we've got a number of senior citizens and they can't shovel their snow in the winter time. We've got folks who need somebody to transport them to go do grocery shopping, whatever it might be to look at what some of the issues are and to have that little neighborhood respond um, is one of the things that they are looking at. They've started with a group of 15 possible, they've narrowed that down to five, and they've begun doing some outreach to identify ideas about those little neighborhoods, both from people who live in them, but also from other resources in the community to hear what some other people think, the school people or police or whoever. What do you think the issues are in this neck of the woods? The uh, last group is the time banking group. And this, again, this isn't focused specifically on poverty, but it came out of the poverty work group. And a, a time bank is kind of a time exchange. It's a local membership organization where the local currency is the work that you do. So Jason, for example, might join, and I, I might join and Greg might join. And Jason's hour of what he can do is, is worth the same as what my hour is of what I can do. So maybe Jason offers an hour of legal service for somebody. He gets an hour worth credited to him in the time bank. I'm a painter, so I, Jason needs his living room painted. He taps into the time bank and pulls in my hour's worth of help for him. Or maybe Sharon is the one who needs the painting service. And she taps me for that hour. Uh, and then she, she owes an hour to the time bank. And I have an hour of credit with the time bank because I've done my work. Jason done, has done his work. Greg may need the work or he may offer the work. So they're looking at this. These folks have visited the Brattleboro Time Bank. There are five other ones that operate in Vermont. Um, and they are hoping by early in the calendar year to have something ready to go uh, with regard to a time bank for Bennington itself. So we'll see where this goes. But that's where we stand today with regard to the seven subcommittees doing the work of that came out of the uh, community visit. Let me ask you, again, dealing with poverty, a couple things come to mind. One, is there anything out there to establish some sort of education for folks, I guess, uh, dealing with, say, foreclosures, seeing how people are at risk now of losing their property, where, um, I mean, is that, first of all, is it a problem here in Bennington? And if so, or we have something that uh, uh, where we head off either with you know, some financial planners or bankers or lawyers or whoever would happen to, to be the experts on that. We do anything in that area? Joe, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything okay. that's going on in that respect. Others may be, but I'm not. And a few years ago, there was an issue uh, when uh, Central Vermont Public Service was providing service to us down here that uh, when people got behind, uh, they were actually uh, 
in the process of losing their service. However, Central Vermont stepped up and we were able to work out something with them for these folks. Now it's Green Mountain Power, but have we done anything to, with these folks to provide outside services? Uh, so when somebody does get behind in paying their power bill or whatever, that uh, uh, they, they know what, where to go without panicking? Some of that is actually happening with Brock. Okay. Some of that's happening with Greater Bennington Interfaith Community Services, the Food and Fuel Fund especially. Okay. And some of that is really helping do education, but some of it is also helping prevent the bill from turning into a shutoff for somebody. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Justin. Has your group been able to identify any of the root, what they say is root causes for poverty in Bennington? It, the, the, answer, the simple answer is no. Um, the, the group is really focusing on the ideas that were generated at the community visit and that were voted on by residents in the local area as opposed to, you know, what, one of the things, for example, um, we know that if somebody, the, the best way out of poverty is a job. Um, we also know that there is some generational poverty in our community, folks who are following in the footsteps of their families over time. How to break those cycles, there are lots of different ideas, and it's actually kind of a theme that will happen when the large group meets about how might we help do something that helps mitigate what somebody else may be doing. We're also doing that in some of the other, the, the for groups um, recognizing that some of what we might need might be generated by something that John's group or Mike's group is working with. But right now, no, no focus on identifying what are some of the core issues, rather it's really to address what are some of the things we might be able to do to affect mm -hmm. change. How often does the idea of lack of quality jobs come up? I guess it would just seem to me that if we're not able to create some jobs in Bennington, um, we're never going to be able to solve any issues surrounding poverty or anything else. Well, I mean, I think that the poverty work group itself is something that it's, it's just a topic of conversation that will come up as opposed to um, what you might be looking for from this particular work group. We're, we're not at that point where we're saying... I just ask, I'm yeah. just curious. Yeah. If I may, I, I was at the initial organizational meeting and um, we did identify a lot of the causes, root causes of poverty and, and the, the decision was really not to create yet another poverty industry organization um, because really the bulk of the people there work in the poverty industry in this town day to day and really know what's going on. Um, the big focus from a lot of the discussion that I got was the collaboration group um, and that would be, you know, speaking to Joe's question, you're, you're getting your power shut off, you, you don't know who to go to, this is a facility to find out who you go to, how you keep your power from getting sure, how you defer your payments or things like that. So uh, there was a, you know, which initial talk of let's not create, you know, reinvent the wheel, try and grease the wheels we have and, and get people to work. In. And it also yeah. is something that the uh, mentoring Arm. work group actually right. talked about as one of the issues that might be identified by that neighborhood. They don't know where to turn. Right. Lots of resources out there, but if you don't know where to start. Right, and, and one of the things that impressed me is every one of the organizations that was represented, when I asked them, had a path out of poverty. You know, if they were an aid group, they had a path out of the aid. You know, this is how we try to get you on your own and, and moving forward. Not everybody follows that path or is able to get onto it, and not everybody's capable, but, but everybody <coughs> seemed to have a formula of this is how we're going to prop you up and help you out and this is where you need to go from there. So, I mean, I think that coordination, and, you know, it's, it's a very impressive group that, that meets, and uh, I was not able to attend during the summer, um, but I get the emails and things. There, so. Yeah, I guess, you know, I just think being able to show somebody, keep somebody, um, show somebody how to stop getting their lights turned off is a little bit of a Band-Aid as opposed to being able to help somebody get a job and be able to flourish economically. Right. You know, stop it before they ever get to that point. Exactly. You know, so it's, right. instead of trying to get it at the back end with how do we keep you from having your lights shut off because you can't pay the bill, how do we create jobs so you can actually have something to, you know, to be able to sustain yourself on. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's also an issue where people have jobs and still are not able to sustain, you yeah. know, their their housing or their electric. Yeah, well, so. the working poverty is a group that emerged in our lifetime. Right. You know, people who have jobs and sleep in cars, you know, and just have been on a slide. And so, creating jobs is one thing; creating the right jobs is another. Other board questions. Uh, Charlie, thanks. That was quite a nice presentation and, and interesting. And the question I have for you is, and I'm not, maybe it is part of one of the six or seven groups you identified, maybe it's something that doesn't really fit, but budgeting seems to be, and maybe that falls under education, but it seems to me that across, it's not, this isn't just a poverty issue, this is across any income strata that exists. People make X and they spend X plus 15 percent, and that, if you make $200,000 a year, that math doesn't work. If you make $10,000 a year, that math doesn't work. Uh, is that been addressed? Because, you know, just observationally, I think probably anybody sitting on this board, maybe anybody watching tonight or certainly sitting here, can probably, as I've said that, think of, oh, that sounds like somebody I know. Has that ever been part of what your group has looked at in terms of? Maybe it's the educational aspect of what you're talking about, but I just think that's so pervasive in today's world that if people could break that cycle, they would go a long way to helping themselves, whether they need $10,000 a year or $200,000. Has that been brought up? It's not, well, it's been brought up, and as Greg said in the initial meetings, the early meetings, it was, a, it was one of the topics of conversation. It's not a specific topic for any of the seven groups at this point. And again, realize we've been doing work now for four months. So this is where we are today. There are organizations in the community that actually do. I mentioned Brock earlier, but this is one of the places where Brock really works with folks who are on the lower economic spectrum. And one of the things that they are doing on a regular basis is the helping people figure out a budget. Uh, the Interfaith Food and Fuel Fund also rely for people who turn to it for financial assistance. You know, if it's a one-time event, you, you know, you're down on your luck. It's one right. thing. If you're coming back every three months for help, you got an issue. And we also refer folks who turn to us on a regular basis to Brock, for example, for budgeting assistance other organizations in the community, depending on who they are, do some of that very same kind of thing. But it can be tough to break. Well, it's a vicious tough to cycle break because, it, you know, I think it falls under a lot of things that you talked about. I think it's a bad habit people get into early in life, and I think it's probably generational in the sense you were talking about generational poverty, that kids coming up see this is how mom and dad live their life or the people who they look up to live their life, and they just think, well, it's okay to run up a huge debt on a credit card, buy a car that is beyond your means, or if you have a limited budget on public assistance to spend it unwisely and, and still overextend yourselves. And like, a, you know, whether it's part of the collaboration part of it to get people directly to those resources or education, it sounds like it. You, I mean, you identified it and you're addressing it. I just, with all, with all the good stuff that you've talked about, I looked, you know, just, I just look at that and think, like you said, I, you know, I don't think anybody. In, we're not going to solve global poverty, but to try to make life better for the people who just aren't quite getting out of everything out of life that they might otherwise get. Uh, that budgeting issue is a big thing because I think there is certainly a confusion. It's the word I'll use between people in terms of what they want and what they need sometimes, and the education of, you know. I really want this, but I can afford and really need that. Uh, you know, sometimes gets lost on. Like I said, that's not just a poverty issue. I think that's across income lines. That's a good point. But uh, just to follow up on it, Jason, because it's been one of the things I think about. Um, I mean, the advertising, and I'll use the, the new high tech stuff. These kids have got uh, the texting, the iPhones, all this stuff. I mean, it seems like everyone comes out, and yeah, I, I'm thinking of people now. They shouldn't be buying these things. That are buying these things, and they turn around and say they don't have money for groceries. Uh, how, how do we how do we get that message out to them? Or is this just something that's ingrained, and we're just going to break that cycle somehow? 
how to break if if we knew how to break the cycle. Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, that would I mean, be I get laughed at because that's, that's right. Laughed. I mean, my, my cell phone has a handle on it. You crank it. I mean, that's how old it is. But uh, you know, I, I see some of these kids that I just know they, they cannot afford these things, but they've got every new gadget that comes out on that in that high tech stuff. Is it true that um, organizations like um, the Interfaith Food and Fuel that they'll actually turn away? They'll look at someone's personal budget, and if they don't meet a certain standard, or they they have certain things in a budget that um, probably shouldn't be there, such as a rent-to-center account, um, that they'll actually be denied? Not from Greater Bennington Interfaith Community Services. It might be something that gets addressed. You know, you're, you're spending X. But again, what we end up doing when we have those kinds of things that come to us, we, we really make a referral to an organization. We have a part-time person who is doing incredible work in that respect. But we'll look to a place like Brock, for example, because we refer lots of folks to Brock, to do the budgeting piece, to do the where are you spending your money piece? How are you deciding where your dollars are going? Um, but the Interfaith Council is not making those kinds of judgment calls that say, you can't do this but would we, and in order to get our money. We don't do a, a quid pro quo. Charlie, um, you know, the, there's a popular perception that uh, um, I think among many people that people who are in poverty become <coughs> acculturated to it. You touched on it briefly generationally. And, um, I'm, you know, I don't think anybody wants to choose poverty. But I wonder if there You'd be surprised. is some, well, maybe if there's some sort of assessment that could be done that. Uh, could identify skills that are needed um, for workforce placement and working in conjunction either with uh, internships uh, with local employers or finding out from local employers what skill sets are needed. Well I know that um, in, in my past life I was involved with not only the Agency of Human Services but some of the workforce development things in the community and I know that Agency of Human Service Departments, the local schools, and the BCIC, the, the, the group that really focuses on not only bringing business here, but looking at the skills that are needed for the jobs of both the present and the future. What's the group Brian Maroney works with? That's one. That's exactly what they do. Yeah. They, um, they had a hear, they had a he's hear, working out of vocational rehabilitation. Right and primarily focusing on people who have disabilities of whatever sort, uh, creative workforce solutions that's is it. what it's called. Yep. Thank you. Um, but again, that's for people who might have an identified physical disability or emotional disability uh, to really help them do the kinds of things you were talking about, Jim. I mean, to get them, to get them reconnected the teen or, moms or the first start the careers and things like that. They Sunrise Family yeah. Resource Center does with this with teens, teen yeah. with teen moms. The high school and community college of Vermont have a very close relationship about getting kids, many of whom are, they might be the very first kid to go to college in their family or, or to get through high school in their family to come to CCV to look at not only the college, but to potentially attend a class there, have it paid for, and have it count as college credits. So there are lots of creative ideas that are in existence in the community. We don't always hear about them. Uh, people who work in that system know them, but how to get all of that information into the public arena, I think it's always a tough thing. Lots of stuff is competing for the agenda. Other board members, you mentioned Interfaith Council just a couple of times. It's not really that, but uh, they've done great work in the past. Still are, but their work relies on the amount of donations they get in to assist. How how is that coming in, in our economic times? Are you still getting the donations? It's it's an incredible organization in that respect. Um, the generosity of people all over, not, not just in Bennington, but all over the county, and some from out of state. Mm -hmm. um, is pretty impressive. Good. It's right right now 
and may it continue. Right now we're doing very well in that respect with uh, both the appeals that we do, but also just the generous support that we get from people that is totally unexpected. Well, that's great to hear, Kelly. Yeah. Thanks. Welcome. Michael, so, you anything you want to wrap up? Thank you very much for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have two more presentations next time, if that's your pleasure. And I think you'll find that they really kind of tie together. Uh, downtown John uh, Shanahan will do, and uh, um, Joanne Arafat will do the um, community center, rec center. Actually, some of the things we're talking about, about peer groups and mentoring, and they'll tie up in the recre center, recreation center, community center thing. And uh, as, as Michael mentioned, too, uh, there's another piece of his, that, that community communication part, which is going to tie up some of the things you're talking about here, making sure there is an inventory of how do you solve those problems? Who, who's the group that's doing it? What is Brock doing? What is the high school doing? What is the community, um, uh, community college Vermont doing? So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. We'll thank come you. back thank again you. Next, next time. Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, the next item agenda is fire department truck proposal. So Chief Desset, Steve, Chief, you want to come up to the mic? And you want to start it off? I'll start it off and then I'll turn it over to Steve. Um, basically, we come before you tonight uh, to ask your permission to research a new piece of fire equipment. It would be a, a rescue pumper truck. Uh, and I appreciate all of you showing up earlier around 5.30 to take a look at the demo that we had downstairs. Um, the fire department, uh, Chief Crawford, and I have been working on this now for a couple of months, uh, trying to get prepared for this uh, presentation. And uh, it's going to be very brief and to the point. Again, we're looking for your permission to uh, form a truck committee and uh, take a look at what's available to replace uh, actually two pieces of fire apparatus that we currently have in consolidating the equipment from those two trucks into one truck, uh, and again, uh, with it being a uh, rescue pumper truck. Uh, as far as financially goes, that's a big uh, piece uh, that I'm responsible for. Currently, we own outright all of the fire apparatus that we have downstairs, uh, and I know some of you earlier had questions about that. Um, two years ago, uh, we were paying out approximately $72,500 uh, per year in payments. Uh, and then as far as uh, owning the trucks outright, uh, this year, for the fiscal year uh, 2013, on July 10th, 2012, we made the final payment on the two 2004 Smeal trucks uh, that we currently own. So again, we own all of the trucks outright. We came to you about a year and a half or so ago uh, with a presentation to replace the one puffer truck that we're looking to replace now, um, and uh, you decided to hold off. I think that based on the information that Chief Crawford and I have been able to put together and looking at some of the equipment that's out there, uh, now it's time to move forward uh, and again consolidate, take two trucks, dispose of those, uh, hopefully net out of that about $150,000 give or take and um, use that money towards the purchase of a new truck. Chief? Yeah, I came to you about a year and a half ago, Joe, and uh, you know we tried to um, you know, I went back to the department and we were looking at ways that we could help the citizens of Bennington and still, you know, respectfully maintain their money the way that we should. Um, you know, I took all your questions and tried to get those answered. And um, going forward, we tried to combine the two trucks. <clears throat> I have first off started out with the department. I asked the two companies that were in charge of those trucks if there was going to be an issue, if we consolidated them. The way we are doing the firefighting now is different than it was years ago. Um, everybody sees that. We have uh, a lot higher training standards and time that my volunteers have to do. Um, you know, and they, uh, they depend on this stuff um, greatly, and they take care of it great. Um, as you can see from the trucks down there, that, you know, we, we take them with great respect and we make sure that they're top notch. Um, by combining the two, um, it would be a, like a first out truck, and it would have everything on it to do essentially the, the beginning of the job of a fire scene or, you know, if it's an accident or a structure fire or anything in between. So that's what we're approaching you folks on is we want to start a truck committee, um, start specking the truck, um, get some proposals from different truck companies, and um, move forward with that. The last time we kind of did it backwards, we, we went and spent a ton of time specking the truck and everything, and then came to you and we wanted to hold off. So trying to go forward. You know, front first and say, "This is what I want to do." Jason, 
um, you know, given the, the request is to form a committee, I'm, you know, I don't think there's any harm in forming a committee, and there's probably some answers that can't be given tonight in terms of what does the maintenance of one truck versus two mean, all sorts of things. If we can cut down on, on a little bit of the lack of a better term infrastructure of the department, but what I was going to suggest. Uh, to the two chiefs in front of us, and this would probably have to be done in concert with Stewart and uh, perhaps Melissa on the town staff, would be as part of any presentation that comes back to this board, we know what the capital plan is right now. I mean, I think this board, when it comes to fleet issues, whether it's the fire department fleet, the highway, water and sewer, police, whatever the fleets are, I think we typically during budget time or during any other time of the year that we look at it, often look to the capital plan to see where are we deviating positively, where are we deviating negatively, and how does that affect us when we have to tax citizens. Let's make that part of this presentation because if we're taking out two trucks, you know, for lack of a better term, and I don't mean it in a bad way, I'm sure you would probably do this anyway, make it a required part of the presentation we can, so we can look at it and say, okay, we're, we are to some degree fundamentally changing the fire fleet Therefore, it's going to change the capital plan. It's going to change how we purchase perhaps other trucks. If we could get what does the new capital plan look like going forward versus the current capital plan going forward if we don't do it, I think that's a much better way to look at it than <coughs> look at this one truck versus these previous two and make a decision on can we afford a, a net cost of whatever the guys come back and tell us the net cost is. I just think it would be better to look at it like yeah, that. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, I mean, I kind of asked the question of Steve and Paul downstairs. Uh, you know, you looked at three trucks inside the bay. I was looking at one outside the bay. That's the next one that has to be replaced according to our capital plan. I believe you guys said, what, 2017 for the yes. hook and ladder? That's correct. And, uh, you know, my question there is is that uh, um, we, we scoped that uh, for 20 years, did you tell me, is what we said? And, and uh, my question is, is that can we get the 22 years or can we get the 23 years without replacing that truck? That would be a major purchase. And that way, if we decide, after we see the specs on this truck, after the committee comes forward and provides us information, will we be able to pay this truck off without asking for a whole lot of money each year from the taxpayers before we have to purchase another truck? Which we have to do. Well, I, think, I think one of the things that Steve and I talked about <coughs> also downstairs is that you know we, we know that we have a reserve account here within the fire department where we set money aside every year and, and we're going to present all of this to you and Jason I appreciate your comments. We'd like to not touch that reserve account with the purchase of this particular new truck and save that for the purchase of the lab truck in 2017 or 2018 when that comes down the pike. So I agree with, with what the, the comments that Jason made. We're also going to look at this truck, Joe, and say, you know, are we going to spec this as a 15-year truck or a 20-year truck? We're going to look at it both ways, and we're going to come back with a number. Um, because right now, we've been specking trucks for 10 years, um, and that affects the capital plan. So if we can build a truck that's going to last for 15 years instead of 10 years, that's going to do right by the taxpayers in this community because we're going to get that truck paid off. We're going to be able to have it for a longer period of time, utilize it effectively, and not have to make payments. Yep. So that's the way we want to go about this. Um, Greg? Another point with this beyond the financial part, um, <coughs> I'd also like to see, but I don't expect to have it on the top of your head, um, uh, trends in volunteers and staffing because I mean one of the advantages to this vehicle from what you explained to me is that it's going to optimize the staff that's uh, that's responding to an incident um, having both the pumper and a rescue truck in one vehicle with one staff um, is going to you know take some of the pressure off membership and also the numbers of responses we're making are, are our calls up are our calls going down are our calls level where, where does that all fall in these our calls days? You know, in the last few years, have been pretty much standardized somewhere between 250 and 300 calls a year. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of those calls are fire alarms. You know, you know, we break that down in the annual report as well, what they are. But what we find is, you know, as we, we make higher demands of the volunteers and stuff, you know, a lot of people, and with the economy the way it is, a lot of people can't volunteer their time. They have to work two jobs and stuff like that. So what we find is it's easier to man the one truck to get in there first versus the two different <coughs> trucks and trying to pick which one you need first. You know, there was a scenario that we talked about, you know, west of town here that, that needed water before the rescue, but the rescue showed up first, you know, and it's an unfortunate mishap. But in the same token, with this, we're trying to, to accommodate all that because 
we still run into that on a daily operation here. You know, it's the same thing, you know, the volunteers, you know, we, we approached the volunteers here first about this and they were they were all for it and, you know, that's where we for most, you know, I try to maintain my guys the best they can and, and uh, well, I think from an emergency services standpoint, it makes perfect sense. It's a matter of do we have what Jason talked about? Do we have the money? Can we, you know, can we do it? Absolutely, and that's why we approached another you know, but to try to, you know, combine it. You know, it like we're talking about, you know, yeah. you're looking at one less service a year. You know, one <coughs> less, you know, one truck we got to not fuel a year, and one more truck that we don't have to insure a year. Right. You know, so it all to me makes better money sense, as, you know, as a taxpayer to to do this route. And uh, I think it'll be a, a great improvement. One of the things that we're going to have to do is, you know, sell it to our consti constituency, um, whatever we decide individually. And um, you know, I'd like to, to also know how much these trucks are actually used. Um, I know that if a fire takes place, you don't use all of the trucks. You know, um, how how often does that pumper sit? How often is it used? Is there a way that you can kind of give us some sort of report on um, the actual use of each yep, I can, vehicle? I can do that, and as well, the rescue that we're talking about now responds to every call because there's equipment on that truck that we would pretty much use for every call, whether it's a CO call or a, a light fixture that may be overheating or something like that. But there's a necessary equipment on the rescue every time. We have three pumper trucks. We're looking to replace one. The, the one that we are looking to replace has a foam system. And that pretty much responds to all the structure fires and stuff like that. Does it respond to every call? Probably not. But that was the, the whole focus of, of combining the two is that would be the first truck out of the station no matter what. And that truck would have everything necessary to do the job that we need to do first and foremost to get started. Because I'd like to be able to tell people that, you know, why we actually need this and that it's not going to sit in the bay. And and uh, we're you know not actually wasting our, our money when it comes to something. And, like and I think Chris, one one of the, the major points here is, and I'll say it again, is to take the take both trucks, combine them, and only have that one truck respond instead of two trucks. You've got all the equipment in place, the cascade system, all the extrication tools, everything you need to actually be a first truck in and start fighting the fire. We don't have to wait for other trucks to get there to support this truck with equipment. Everything's going to be on this truck and ready to go. Um, and again, I mean, it's, it's beyond, the truck that we're looking to replace is beyond uh, replacement time in the capital plan. Um, so I, I think that it's a good time to start looking at this and uh, let us put some proposals together, come back and try to sell it to you and then you can try to sell it to your constituents. I, I, and like I told you earlier, when I first started, I, I support this. Uh, that's one of my roles and responsibilities is to meet with these guys and, and I do support this. Justin. Last year during the budget time, I guess we had talked about a scouting truck, so to speak. Um, it was a rapid response. Maybe. Okay. The ultimately, I don't think we were able to approve at the time, but would this kind of serve that role as well? Would this truck be in that capacity? Would that still come up later down the pipe? Or this, this? this particular truck here uh, is going to be the truck that you've got to look at downstairs as a six-person crew mm -hmm. uh, type cab, and I think ultimately we'd be looking to <coughs> A seven or eight person cab. So that again, that truck would be first truck out um, and responding, and everything's going to be on that particular truck. So we're not going to come back to you if you're asking. Are we going to come back at budget time and ask for a rapid response vehicle? Our focus is on this truck. Kind of what I'm asking. <laughs> 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 you sure. said something about an eight passenger or an, yeah, an eight passenger vehicle. When the fire tone goes out. All the guys don't come here. Currently, correct. But that that'll be what'll happen if we have this new truck. Currently, well, yeah. I we're, mean, I see trucks. We're doing a, a new yeah. learning curve, trying to you know get the response better. It's it's better controlled if we have more people on the truck here before it leaves the station, and we're looking to do that in the future. The other thing is is that each one of the seats that we're talking about holds an air pack, um, mm -hmm. an SCBA. So we're looking at maximizing the two trucks now have um, ten. SCBAs on them. So with the, with the eight crew, you'd have seven SCBAs on that truck in the seats. More Is that going to make you take more time to respond? It will, waiting for everybody to get here? Not necessarily. It would be it, the delay would be more cost. It would be more effective in the response that we would get having the people there when the truck got there to do the job. Okay. So I would not say that it would uh, eliminate the fact that 
you know, if we needed something right away or whatever, that would go that route. But it would definitely make it more feasible for us and more controlled at the scene to have that. And the other thing that, that Steve had brought up too was when the guys, when the firefighters jump in this truck to respond, the equipment's there and they can stop downing the equipment before they actually get there. Whereas now, they wait sometimes for the truck to get there, then take the equipment out. Whereas if they respond here, they can be equipped and ready to go when they roll up on the scene, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. So you're given permission to start uh, specking out this truck and give us some numbers. You're already in your budget process. Uh, I'm trying to recall, we've upgraded our communication system recently. We've done some other things in the fire department uh, as far as upgrades. Uh, when we were downstairs, you were telling me, or somebody was telling me, that uh, there's new requirements as far as the uh, the safety decals in the back of the truck. Well, we're going to have to provide that. We're going to have to put those on our other trucks. Uh, are we no, grandfathered? Those trucks don't... are grandfathered. And same with vehicle. the hose covers and those kind. Of, I, I guess what I'm exactly. asking: Can you foresee any other major expenses? Not not the price of a truck, but twenty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars expenditures that you see coming up in the near future for the fire department. I think our radio equipment is, is pretty much up to date now with, with a lot of those federal grants or in state grants that we received. Um, I'm not aware of any major expenses at this point. Turn out equipment or any other? I think as we, you know, the, as we do the budget process, the way we've been handling it, you know, you know, staggering it year to year, I think, you know, we're maintaining that. The thing that, are, the thing that we're not going to be able to budget is, is the unforeseen stuff. Right. Um, and the other thing, you know, that we have is the, the two trucks that we're looking to place are the oldest two pieces of equipment that we have other than the ladder truck, which, you know, in theory should eliminate the, the chance of a major failure, a pump or a motor or something right. like that. So how long will it take you, once the committee's formed, to get back to us with the bottom line? I would say, you know, getting with the manufacturers and stuff like that, you know, this day and age, it doesn't take a huge amount of time, but I would say uh, legitimately, I could have all the answers for you in four, roughly four months or so. Before we get to the budget. Try to. Yeah, no, so. no, budget so. will be over. But yeah, right that's now we're doing the budget for the fire department. And that's the other reason that, you know, we're here tonight too is that, you know, that's, you know, Jason brought back last time, you know, I don't see this in the budget, you know, when we approach the truck. And I want to make sure that right. if we're going to go this route, we want to see something in there at least to say. <coughs> well, you know, Steve, exactly. What I was getting at is, is you know, when uh, I'm probably misspeaking, so correct me if I'm wrong. You know, sometimes we talk about things like radio equipment or communications equipment. I know we had a, uh, a sensory piece of equipment we right. talked about at some length in the fire budget one or two budgets ago, and those kind of not to minimize the importance of those pieces of equipment, but those can be handled in a kind of a year to year. Can we afford 15,000 there, 25,000 there? Or can right. we finance it over a two year period and minimize it? We're in a $10 million budget. Those, we can debate, do we need to have them? But they aren't gonna, ultimately they won't break a budget and they won't really move a tax rate. But what I was getting, you know, with fleet issues, right. those do move budgets. And those, I, I think this board, you know, I, been spending a lot of time with most of these folks here in January and I think most of the people here take the time to look at to have a general understanding of what the capital plan is and have a sense of okay here's what it is this year and for the next fully understanding their projections they're not in concrete and I just think on this type of an issue particularly because it fundamentally does change a fleet that there's been a fair amount of capital planning put into if in concert with what you're going to do, Steve, and what you're going to do, uh, Chief, with the uh, with the manufacturers, and get a sense of here's what we think we can sell these two units for. Here's what we think a fully equipped, properly equipped unit is going to be coming in. Here's the difference. Here's how we're going to finance it. How's that going to affect the capital plan? You know, what does what does this do to the fire capital plan? Just so we have a sense of what that is going forward, then we know. I mean, and this might be something, too, that, that, you know, we come to you with and we, we present it and you say, hey, that looks good, but can you do this? And we go back to the drawing board and, and work on it. I mean, this isn't, it's not like going down to Carbone and buying a car right. and expecting no, the answer yeah, right then and there. Exactly. I mean, this, this might take a little bit of work. Right. And we, and we understand that. And the same token, we're, we're looking at, you know, you talk about the future budgets and stuff like that as, you know, maybe the possibility of getting this truck loaded with, you know, a thousand feet of hose that we're going to need in the next couple years in the budget. 
you know, we load an hour, and the SCBAs that are becoming outdated, maybe we get it in on this truck coming in so that, and we can differentiate that, and you say, all right, well, we can separate this out and put that, you know, that's a $50,000 option, maybe we can change or whatever like that, you know, but we'll break that apart. Right. And I know you don't mean it like this, but just to make, I'm not minimizing the importance of fifteen or $25,000 decisions. I just, you know, which piece of communication, communications equipment or the, uh, I think it was a camera that we were talking well, about. Camera. Exactly. A, a camera at that point. You know, these are several hundred thousand dollars. I'm just, you know, just so we can get a sense of, okay, here's what it's going to cost, but here's how it's going to affect the fire department for the next five to ten years that we've got on the capital plan. And if it's a way to say, okay, we're going to, if we do take those types of expenses you're talking about, see, and cover them in the purchase of a new truck, then I would say it would be fair uh, to say, okay, where does this come out of a future budget? So that, you know, you absolutely we right. would have we're to have the kind of discipline on the board to say, okay, we see a spike here, but we expect a valley there, absolutely. and we all have to hold each other to that. And you should, rightfully so. It's the same thing as the maintenance, you know, I mean, as same the trucks get older, the maintenance are going to go up. Yep. If you buy a new truck, you got warranty to cover. We talked about what warranty is going to be, and it should drop some of the maintenance. And absolutely some of the major major failures should go away and, you know, what we're over budget on with the maintenance yeah. as well. Okay, is there any on the board that does not feel strongly about allowing the fire department to go forward, public safety, and check this truck out and come back to us? Do I have one more thing, too? Okay. Just, just so you know, and, you know, talking with Jason last time and stuff like that, we did reach out to the ISO and ask them, you know, if we were going to, if we were going to eliminate two trucks and get one, if it would change the taxpayer base on the ISO standard under insurance. And they said as long as we maintain the NFPA standard and don't lose any equipment, there is no change. Good. Okay. So we did. Okay. So rather than a motion, we just consensus. Consensus. Yeah, so I think so. Yeah. Chief, thanks for coming this time for us. Give us a heads up. Uh, you understand our concerns. We've been through this before. And uh, there's no one on this board, I know, that doesn't have the utmost respect for our volunteer fire department. You guys do a tremendous job. Uh, just go down and look in the bays and look how the equipment is maintained on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and uh, I'm really proud of, of the force. I know everybody else in here. And uh, if it's a smart thing to do, uh, we'll do it. But uh, we've got to take and be conscious of the cost. Uh, Jason's comment on the capital plan, we've been talking about that. We must look at this fleet. Uh, and yours too, Paul. I mean, not just the, the fire fleet, but all, the, the, all our fleet vehicles. And if we can get an extra year out of uh, even one of them, then we got, uh, we're ahead for the taxpayers' purposes. So thanks for your presentation, and we'll be waiting to hear from you again. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item is the agency funding policy for fiscal year 1-4-14. That's the fiscal year coming up. It's the issue that's going to be on this March's ballot. So I'll open the discussion. Anybody who wants to start it? Just, just one comment. I would say uh, on the list that was given to us, we should probably add named officers of each group. I think we routinely get that, but it wasn't on the list. Okay, so we got name of organization right under that and officers. Good point. Well, membership of board, right, <coughs> and officers. To that. Right, that's, that's, that's yeah. what I noticed. And I, right. I think typically we get that, but that is important. I think that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Anything else on this checklist? Um, you know, I don't see it. It probably gets hidden or could be covered under uh, various budget issues for each of the agencies. And I'm, not I don't even know the, I'm not following you, Jason. Well, what I'm saying, what I'm getting at is, is another thing that we don't have, and it might be covered under, you know, when they provide their budget, is what other requests have they made and what other uh, public monies have they applied for in terms of grants or in terms of loans or in terms of other program proceeds that might be available to any any of the programs other, that other give funding us that. you know instead of just coming to the town of bennington the town of shaftesbury the we, town do, of we do we do include that jason the second to the last yeah. line i think addresses list all okay there it is list, yeah, no, list all revenue sources and, that and is. last year we began to ask we want it broken out by town so that we know 
that right but I'm not limiting it to they asked us for X and they asked Shaftesbury for something else I want to know did they get other grants and other did they get other grant money yeah. and if we see that they didn't get any other grant money that might beg the question why not okay I mean I know as, as a member of this board there seems to be a river of grant money for certain subjects of things I would think a lot of the nonprofit organizations out and about in the countryside that want to hit up taxpayers for money could also avail themselves of grant money where available. Well, just fundraising in general would be in that too, right? Yes, fundraising should be there too. So we should be able to see all that from the given organization's budget, I would imagine, correct? Or, it well, should be listed times, in the budget. Many times you, you, you don't. Unless you're willing to go through the financial breakdown or through the audit, you're not going to find every, they don't necessarily list every <coughs> source of revenue. Okay. And, and we're, we're suggesting and you're saying to us, we want to see that up front so that it's easy to find, easy mm -hmm. to identify. The purpose of the current policy, the, the current policy is, if I'm correct, um, as long as they don't ask for a, a larger amount than they did the year before, we've just been putting them on the ballot without the signatures, is that? Is well, a couple, that couple of the issues, if I recall, what we're, we're looking at is one, do we want to ask them to go back well, go back to our old policy where they had to go get the signatures every year before they put on a ballot. Do we want to accept the policy as it is now that they've got a set number and unless they ask for an increase, they don't have to go out and get it? Or do we think that, uh, should we have a period of time, should we say that uh, um, you're good for two years or three years without having to go back to public, but every three years you've got to go back to the public or your agency? So, I mean, there's a, a bunch of things tied in. I'm probably forgetting something we talked about before. Well, how about if they ask for a 20% decrease? We don't make them go out and get the signatures. I mean, that'd be a, that'd be a way to motivate some, <laughs> some budgets. You I, know I, I, do, I know last year we went out, we, were, you know, we had our hands tied with the budget last year, and we asked organizations to take a 10% cut. Yeah. Um, and they did. And they did. Except for Well, they came back, finally did, well, I think, at the end, yeah. Well, my question I have about that is, um, since we asked them to, uh, to decrease their amount 10%, um, and we, we keep them, are they stuck at that level that they agreed to, to go down to? What they got signatures for is 10% is more than what we gave them. Does that make sense? I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't think we should do that because we didn't really, I don't think we presented it in that way last year. I don't think we did either. I think we presented it as a one-time thing. No, no, so they sure. come back this yeah. year with the initial number, that's their approval. Right. right. But I think going signatures. forward, I mean, personally, I think we should be requiring the signatures going forward. Each year? I would say so. Because I, I think it creates a choice. I mean, right now, you know, an organization can make the decision to go out and fundraise, or they can make the decision to go out and try and solicit 500 voter signatures. You know, if you add them all up, it's well over $100,000. It comes into the town's budget every year. <coughs> and, you know, I've ta just, just talking to people about it, there's some folks out there that have a real problem being mandated to donate to charity. Um, and at some point, really at this point, it stops becoming a donation. And it's really just another tax to fund these organizations. But it never gets defeated. Yeah, it goes through, that's a good point. And the other thing is that in a lot of times it's, it's services that the town people feel that they would wind up having to take care of or would land on their doorstep if the town didn't do it as a collaborative. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think that's been established over time. Um, with a lot of these organizations and, and nationally as well. The, uh, the question of whether they do it every year, I think if you want you, to say in one breath, they want these people to be more efficient and in the next breath say want them to be you know, going, using their limited volunteers to go get signatures and that thing is a struggle for me. Um, I don't have a problem with validating it once in a while, making sure people are still paying attention and all that. Um, I could see you know, a three year cycle where if you stay constant, you supply all the paperwork for three years, you can stay on the ballot, but you're going to have to, you know, yeah. get out and do the dirty work. Because a year isn't a long time. I agree, you know? I agree and, with uh, Greg on that. And if, you know, I mean, a lot of these organizations are tried and true organizations. They've got good people. They share volunteers among each other. So you know, they're, they're, they're really managing time. It's, you know, we're not talking about big nationals. And if you go to the, uh, if you go to the secretary or the attorney general's fundraising page, and look at what people charge for fundraising. You know, the only viable way for, for people this size to do fundraising to do it themselves. I mean, if you hire a fundraising oh, agent, you're paying 60, 70% of what they raise 
in a lot of cases to get that money. So organizations this size really have to do it themselves. So that's their volunteers. Uh, Joe, if I yep, may make a comment. You know, I, I've made some comments in the previous meetings that are that are, you know, have been along the lines of what Sharon and Greg were just talking about. But you know, I I think Justin makes a very good point. And uh, you know, fundamentally, that is a comment that I hear quite a bit, and it's. It's a comment that is, hey, wait a minute, that's, I don't want my tax dollars to support certain things. I want to donate my money to, to what I want to donate it to. Uh, I, I think there's, there, there's a fair medium in between the two, even more than what we talked about in the last couple of meetings where it's, we used to have a, a signature every year and then you've kind of let it go, assuming we got this information, which I think we can all agree we don't get that information from everybody we give money to. I think we've identified some people that well, I think we've identified others that do not. But perhaps a legitimate solution to that is, is come up with a threshold number that above, above a certain number of thousands of dollars, they have to get a signature every year. They, just, they have to go get the signatures every year because it's just too big a commitment for a taxpayer for it not to have been garnered, the signatures. Although you can then look at the the opposite of that comment, say there's a couple organizations out there that are looking for, and I'm not trying to minimize the importance or the amount of money because certainly they're important, but for $3,000, for $4,500, for things like that where they've provided the information and they've gone out and received the signatures in the past, maybe we look at those people and say, under a certain threshold number every three years is fine because certainly for an organization that only needs needs to, uh, I used Parent Recreation as an example last time that does a very thorough job in providing information. That's a very small organization. They squeeze a lot of money out of their budget. It's, I think, a $3,000 request to 33, th low 3,000. It's one of the smaller requests. They give us everything we ask for without any headaches, without us asking twice. For an organization that size to go get 500 signatures is a fundamentally different request than asking some four million dollar a year businesses to go garner the same signatures which for you know relatively speaking it's a much smaller request for them to go do that and they're getting relatively higher amounts of money and so I'd say let's consider putting a threshold number out there where we say okay underneath these amounts you're good for three years above a certain number you're getting it every year you know, I think there's. An, I like that idea. I think that definitely has some some good merit. But I think for the organizations also to go out sometimes and to actually try to find those signatures it could be good for them in a lot of ways because it does spread awareness and it could potentially get some people involved that weren't involved before. And it is a bellwether to what support they have. There's that side. Certainly. Let me use your example, parent Jason, just for example. Um, let's say we didn't have a parent recreation association. Do you feel with the facility that's over there, uh, the people of Bennington would expect the town to pick up the services they provide? I, I'm really, I don't think I'm qualified to answer okay. that question. I just use parent recreation in the scope of it is a very, yeah. it's not a full time business. You know, homeless shelter, right. full time business. Brock, full time yeah. business. No, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I, I agree. I like that idea you're coming up with. My, my point is, is some of those people provide services. That if they no longer provide them, I think we would be expected to provide them out of the general fund. Now, if you ask me, go to the nine agencies and tell you what they are, I'd have to go step by step. We all would, uh, but uh, I think that's a that's a fair assessment. I think uh, first of all, I don't recall any of them ever dropping, at least in my lifetime here. People vote for them. Uh, well, well, that was the main generally. reason. Yeah, one did last year. We okay. lost two, CRJ and WBC. Yeah, that's right, too. But that was okay. the main reason we we broke them all out and right. listed them separately is so people that didn't choice. want to support something right. didn't have to vote for it. And if you wanted to support it, you did. Yeah, but, you, did. you know, to, to Justin's point, though, yeah, I understand what you're saying, Sharon, but that misses the bigger picture <coughs> because if somebody doesn't support Organization X, even if they vote, if the vote is, if there's, a thousand people that show up to vote and the vote is 999 to 1. There is, in my opinion, a legitimate philosophical argument that says, why is that one person being forced to spend 
their tax dollars on a charitable organization they don't support. So even when we break it out, I don't think that it still goes beyond the scope of that. But it still gives you a choice. Well, it gives you a choice, but it, it makes you go along with the majority on something you may not support individually that certainly if you wanted to write a check, you're more than capable of writing a check That's to that true. organization. I, I, mean, I, I, I think that that's point, the social but... contract is, you know, I mean, there's years when I don't have the money to write the checks I'd like to to people, right. and, and, and then there's years that I do. Yeah. And in the greater good, you know, we get together and we try and balance that out. Um, you know, if we have a bad year and the American Red Cross shuts down and leaves, then we have a fire in a good year, we're in trouble. You know, I mean, there's, there's charities that we've all benefited from as a society that, that get government funding and get backing as a collective act. Let me, let, me, let me ask for a definition here because I'm getting confused. I don't see a charitable organization necessarily the same as a, as, as, as a nonprofit. Am I reading this wrong? Or all There's an organization you can donate money to and get a tax deduction for right. and support with your pocketbook. You know, nonprofit organizations are not necessarily charities. That's that is correct. true. Okay. That is true. And that's, you know, and that's a part of the distinction right. that, that these petitions make is, you know, I mean, there's there's nonprofit organizations that have executive directors that make upwards of $200,000 a year. Um, they're, you know, whether they're cultural or whatever, they're nonprofits. That doesn't necessarily mean they're right. charitable in, in my not opinion, yeah. sorry, I I'm didn't sorry, realize you were so but in my opinion, the best example in Bennington of what Greg is talking about is the Bennington Free Library, where we've, I think, have a fairly good consensus that if, A, it's good to have a library like that in Bennington, B, it's very good for our downtown, and C, if we had to run the library, the budget would be at least at least double what it costs the taxpayers to run that. And oh, by the way, this weekend, Hannaford's has a non as a uh, bake, sale. <laughs> bake sale for the free library. Everybody come in and attend Hannaford's. That's a, and that's a, <laughs> bake, that's a, that's bake, a good bakery at Hannaford, too. Yep. Yeah. Bake for, right. uh, paid for by Hannaford, and their employees are baking. Uh, that's... I'll be there. I'm just, okay. I'm just telling you your point. You're right. Well, they work hard. But, not just you know, that's an example right. of an organization that really is part of the fabric of the town. We do, I feel very comfortable, I, I think you know that I feel very comfortable advocating that position on behalf of the library based on what they bring to the town. But, you know, we just 20 minutes ago had a conversation with with. I'll use Charlie Gingo as an example. I mean, he, I learned a few things listening to Charlie talk about different, or, oh yeah, that organization does this, that's right, there's this, there's that. And I don't think the uh, negation of $10,000 from somebody's budget would bring collapse upon, no offense to whoever used the term, the social contract we have to provide these services. I think there's a lot more out there uh, than any one of these organizations uh, fills a void. I mean, you know, you can make the, uh, I think, the, like I said, the library is an example of something that would, if we didn't have a library in a town, I'd be amazed if a town this size didn't have a library, that would cost the taxpayers several hundreds of thousand dollars each year, every year, increasing each year going forward to maintain the same facility as opposed to what those volunteers and that staff provides us at a, at a very reduced cost. I don't think I can say the same for if, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if any one of those agents, you know, if CRJ lost on the ballot last year, they're still there, and if they weren't there, I suspect there would be other organizations that might sprout and do similar work. I don't think it's going to create a collapse of those different organizations. Yeah. Uh, this is our last meeting in October. I'd kind of like to formulate tonight a policy to be able to give the steward to get it in writing for us so we can have it finalized at our next meeting. Uh, if we're changing the policy we have, I think we owe it to these people to get it out as soon as we possibly can. Uh, so um, I've heard a couple good ideas. Somebody want to put, a, put something together here? Jason, uh, you seem to be popular. Um, I move that we do the following regarding Town of Bennington agency funding for the next year. Number one, that each agency that wishes to, uh, actually before I make the motion, 
Stu, if and clarify the point of law for me. If an organization collects the 500 signatures this 5%, year. 5%, let's make sure. 5%, 5%. you're right, 5%. Collects 5% of the registered list to be put on the ballot. Do they need to provide this information or is it simply they they just get to go on the ballot for that amount? I think they just go on the ballot. They go on, they go on the ballot. If they petition, they go on the ballot. Okay. They don't need to provide any of this information. And the motion is this. For existing agencies that collect uh, from the town of Bennington, if they are un if their annual request is under seventy seventy five hundred dollars or under, then they only need to provide signatures every three years, provided this information that's on the list provided to us by Stu, including officers, which we added tonight, is provided by. January 1st of each year for the previous year. Secondly, <coughs> requests over $7,500 require the 5% each and every year. Thirdly, because of what I think is is heavily volunteer staffed and does create what I think is is a uh, a huge service for the town of Bennington that the Bennington Free Library be exempt from the 500 signature the 5% requirement provided they provide this information each and every year because of the demonstrated savings they have given the taxpayer versus uh, what the taxpayer would end up paying uh, if they funded the library each and every year would that also include the North Bennington Library as an exempt organization? North Bennington Library, if I recall, is a $12,000 request. I hadn't considered that. I just... That's never on the ballot, is it? It's Generally, the libraries are included right in the budget. Yeah. We review so them we and we it, look for the... Why don't we keep the libraries? Keep just, the libraries that's, that's, I'll budget. modify the motion. So that's, you got, that's right. So strike three. I'll, I'll second the motion made by Jason. Well, before you second, I want to make sure. Maybe he's not done yet. Stuart, are you are you done with the motion, Jason? Stuart, it was any questions one, of the I'm motion? Can I just have clarification? Let's get clarification. Yes. Actually, yeah, we're just don't scratch, don't libraries are scratched libraries. out. Thanks. Yep. Okay, we clear enough now to put this together, just Stuart? Quick yes. question. Oh. We, you know, get a second and okay. we'll get a discussion. Sorry. Okay, second? Second. Okay, now we can have a discussion. Uh, the question for you, Jason, is uh, as far as classification goes, uh, the chair, the um, the library, how is that classified? Library's out. We're taking it out. Of okay, the um, but so there would be no other, no other exceptions. Let's say for other charities, um, as opposed to nonprofits. Well, wait a minute. Again, we'll go back to fact of law here. Stuart, anybody, any agency can come to us offline and ask us to do a one-time shot. I'll, I'll use the uh, disabled American veterans a few years ago. So let's say another organization comes that way. They don't look for annual. Things they can come to us and either with 500 sig or 5 percent signatures or ask us to place them, right? Yes. If if they if they petition and and get the necessary number of signatures, they must be placed on the ballot. Right. Uh, this is for money monetary right. items. Uh, and it, an agency that is seeking help for a particular instance right. can approach the board and say, "Would you in fact fund me this time for this amount?" It's, it's not an annual uh, appropriation, uh, and the board can consider those requests as well. Funding, but we can also consider placing it on the ballot without asking for the required signatures, yes. right? Okay. You may place any item a on one -time the ballot that you deem necessary and appropriate. Okay. Well, I think we, I mean, inherently we have, that's the budget making power that's inherent to this board. We can right. put whatever we want in that budget, but this is a, this is a, a citizen wants to. Right, right. This I mean, is a referendum type. Well, the example I was using a few years ago when uh, we were approached by the, uh, the Disabled American Veteran Organization to place on the ballot, we're talking about placing something on the ballot, a one time shot, would the, if I remember right, would the voters of Bennington approve a $10,000 exemption from their value of their property for property tax 
and I think the board said yes, we'll put that on the, on the ballot without you getting the signatures. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of example I'm talking about. It was not a monetary thing as far as asking the tax dollars directly, it was this thing. So that's still in effect. Yes. I think that gets to your question. Mm -hmm. Somebody come yeah. there. Okay, so, and, and we're going to require financial information from everybody regardless. No. Only if, well, if they get the signatures they every year, we don't need to sign every year. We don't have right. the right to ask. Right, for right. That. Okay. And I wonder if we should uh, be specific to um, Park McCullough Library in Bennington and not just say all libraries are exempt. I don't know if that would open this up to. Well, we're just leaving that off. Well, we're, we're just, we're we're talk start, we're just yeah. taking yeah. that sentence off. It's already addressed. So can we read the motion back one more time before one, we just one, one, one more question. Um, with respect to uh, the, the requests, are most above 7,500 or below? Or My or recollection is 7,500 is probably a mean figure. Yeah. It's not an average figure, but it's a mean figure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, can the recorder please read back the motion as you understand it? Um, part one would be that each agency that collects from the town of Bennington have a request of $7,500 or under. Um, only every three years be asked to give signatures, providing they provide each all the information requested, including members of their boards by January 1st. Mm -hmm. The second portion would be any request over $7,500 would have to have signatures every year. I think a simpler way to put that would be if you want more than $7,500 a year, go back to the old rule. Get the signatures. Let the voters vote on it. Uh, yes, that is the accurate yeah, way correct. to put it. But yeah. that's, I mean, yeah, okay. as I sit here <laughs> thinking about it, the simpler way to look at it would be, right. <laughs> you know, if you want more than $7,500 a year. Yeah. And general, I, okay. I like because, I mean, at, at $7,500 and you get above there, they're probably a larger organization, a little more infrastructure. It's not going to be as well, taxing. It, it shouldn't it's be as taxing. Yeah. And to Sharon's point, uh, I, you know, frankly, the comment I feel the strongest about on this is probably spitting into the wind, but I wish this board and every other select board in the state of Vermont would write every legislator in the state of Vermont and say, repeal this law. This is a bad, bad law. This was great 20 years ago. This was fine before that. It's a different world. It does not take a lot to get 5% of the registered voters to get it on the ballot, and the rate at which these ballot measures pass even surpasses incumbents' reelection to the Congress, which is at 95% plus, it is a bad way to spend taxpayers' money. At least this way, we're forcing the larger people to go out every year. They have to at least be forced to get a bellwether indication of well, can they even get the 500 signatures, and then you know they've got to they've got to get votes when it comes time to mm -hmm. to get their budget. You know, and I, I think there should be a higher standard to be on a ballot, but. That's what we're stuck with. Yeah. I've got another point there uh, with respect to the 7,500 bucks. Now, let's say each year that they, uh, and this is something we talked about in the previous meeting, um, and it, my concern or um, curiosity was, where's the money being spent? How's it being broken down? Now, that's in a, in a nonprofit, let's say a nonprofit, which uh, their well, primary the function, wait a minute, is to, wait a minute, is to, right, but if, if they get the necessary 500 signatures, right. They, we don't need this, so, so we don't know where the money is going. That's, that's, you know, yeah. in, in a sense, you know, Jim, that's true today that's before mm -hmm. we vote on this motion. If somebody yeah. who's always been getting mm -hmm. the signatures and we, we've given them the exemption and they come back to us and, well, we don't want to give you items mm -hmm. uh, 8, 16, and, and 4 on this list, we're just going to go get the 500 signatures. They're free to do that okay. right now, and we don't have the right to collect this information. I mean, we're not abdicating gotcha. anything there. Right. We're just saying... Okay. If you want the quote unquote big money, go get your signatures. And, and like I said, editorializing for a moment, I wish we'd repeal that law on a statewide basis. We're stuck with it. Okay. Claire. So, for the organizations that choose to request less than $7,500, what is this list of um, information due to this board? My motion was January 1st simply because then we would have it in hand by the first Saturday in January, which is historically our first budget meeting. And if they don't provide that... And we typically January, don't address this at our first budget meeting either. We usually no, we do that don't. at our second at the earliest. So we'd have typically eight to ten days to digest that if we can. But the intent, as I understand it, if they don't provide this... Should that language be included in there? they don't go on the ballot. 
Great. Should the language be included in this? Or if it's incomplete. Or if it's incomplete. So that's why I want to know. That's why I asked if we read the budget, or the motion again. Have we included that? Is that part of that? That yeah. language clear? is not in there. Yes, right? it, it is, is clear. There? Okay, it's clear. So one more time, please, for me. If for some reason I'm missing something on this. That each agency that is requesting over seventy-five hundred dollars, under seventy-five hundred dollars. We'd only have to provide signatures every three years as long as they provide all info requested on the checklist by January 1st. Okay, when does the three years begin? Are they exempt from 14? Or do they have, does everybody, that's where I'm going. Do everybody have to do it this year? I would, well, I'd say it's all right to just start right away. This has been going on since 2009. With the, they have time. With the 2014 budget. I mean, They've got the time right now. I would say if you're under 7,500, you're good. Give us the information. Right. If you're over 7,500, if you're 7,500 or below, give us the information. Don't get the 500 signatures. Okay, so everything over begins. Get all agencies will do it this year. The three years for the 75 or less begins. Now we count three years before they have to do it again. In other words, they've got to get the signatures this year. No, no, I don't think that's the motion. Okay, so, okay, that's where I'm confused. The, the time clock starts now. So they're so good right now. So parents, so parents $3,300. Dollars, they're good for $3,300. Get, get, get us this information. Like three they years do every from now, year. they get it again. Okay, that's Come what back I'm saying. Right. Over 7500 I'm clear now. Okay, good. <coughs> Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion. And that is unanimous. Okay. Good discussion, folks. Okay, next item, Stuart, Memorandum of Understanding, United States yes. Army National Guard. Uh, this is, is, has uh, been kind of off and, and dormant for some time. Uh, the last time we met and discussed this, we asked the uh, National Guard to amend the Memorandum of Agreement. Uh, to include the language that you see shaded on page two, which has to do with complying with uh, state law regarding the purchase and transfer of any real estate. We also asked to add uh, to the uh, section five on page three, paragraph A, that it may be modified or terminated by the parties upon written request of either party. The word terminated was not in the original this board had a concern that if we wanted to get out, uh, we should be able to do so by written notice. Uh, they are in agreement with that, and therefore this meets the requirements that this board requested, and I submit it to you for acceptance and signatures. Comments? First of all, let me just ask a question. I mean, it, uh, we all answer it fine. I, I'm one of these who really believe that we will really miss the boat if we don't acquire that armory when it's given up at the town of Bennington. And I think Stewart's comment before where we, the board has not decided it's use yet, but we, we've been in there, we see what it has that we don't have as a town that people want. Uh, I think uh, I was surprised at some of this language. I guess this is, their, their lawyer wrote this up or what? Yes, sir. I've never seen some of these phrases, maybe Jason has before, but that last paragraph, I've never seen that in any agreement. Performance agreement, neither party subject to acts of God, government regulations, disaster. Maybe that's a, somebody who deals with it all the time. But I, 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 that doesn't. I, I would I, actually. I would say that's. I give you two comments. First, in a in a in a uh, in an agreement like this, that probably wouldn't cross my mind to include something like that yeah. in this. But I don't think it affects no, no, anything I know, like I this. No. I, I, it's a fairly, I mean, this language is fairly typical language that gets either party out of an obligation for uh, acts or right. events that are completely out of their control. On page two, though, we have two blanks in there. Uh, for they took place on, is, do we have to fill that in before we approve this? Uh, no, I would, I would fill it in after, after it's approved, but it would basically be uh, today's, today's date. date. At, okay. at, and at this location, um, and, I, and I can tell you all that uh, the National Guard uh, has uh, sent surveyors onto the site, uh, so they are continuing their interest now. 
uh, and they're they're taking a look at the charge site and, and doing some surveying work there as we speak probably good I'm completely in favor of this I think it's a win for us in, in all aspects so. okay mm -hmm. any other comments from the board okay I'll entertain a motion on this one I'll move that we accept the memorandum of agreement from the armory Sorry. from the Adjutant second. General. Second. Okay. We have two seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can see. Take your Jim or Craig? Either one. We're putting them both in. Uh, all right. Any further discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thanks, folks. Um, I'm going to ask a question, Stuart. And shut me up if I'm not. In this, the second item in our packet here, I'll just use the title. Um, has to do with the solar farm. Is there a reason? So that has to be discussed in executive session. It can't be discussed in open session. Well, um, there are some legal issues involved there that we'd like to make sure that you uh, fully understand. Um, and there, you may have some questions about some of the, the commitments on either party that would normally be discussed in executive session. Uh, okay. Certainly, if you decide to accept that, uh, you would be coming out of executive session to accept it. Okay. And then it would become available to the public. Okay, fine. Uh, and my thoughts, folks, is if we find no problem with this, I think this is something we need to get out to the public that we're doing uh, as quick as we can. Okay, then we'll move on to uh, other business. We'll start with Chris. Um, nothing tonight, thanks. I have nothing. Justin, Good. Jim, Jason? No. Greg? Uh, one quick question for Stuart. Um, going back to the armory, I may remember Joe Hall had a, a letter in the paper a few months back, um, and I've had a few questions about it about using the armory for community events and things like that. that yeah, um, the assertion was that the armory was subsidized by the town in its initial construction to expand what they were planning so that it would be available to Bennington residents for, for community events and whatnot. Um, do you have any information on I that? I know of no such agreement. I know that they do. You can rent the armory out okay. for, for certain events, uh, but given today the tenor of today's uh, security issues, uh, it would be, I think it would be highly unlikely that they would simply open the doors to any right. any group or any opportunity. Uh, so you have to work your way through the process in order to, so it's to rent the space. through them and yes. their discretion during deployment, et cetera, would come in. Yes. Okay. Right. And, you know, it's, it's either through the, the Army, the National Guard itself, right. or Bravo Company has, their, their commander sponsors things, that company sponsors things for the community from time to time in there. And I would say if somebody wanted something special, they could talk to him also. He has the authority on a, on a, on a controlled basis of what he can allow in there. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Chair? I have nothing. Stuart, do we want to, yeah, we do want to uh, update the latest information we hear from FEMA on the uh, recovery cost? Um, or do we want Dan to do it? Well, uh, <laughs> we won't. I don't want to get people's hopes up too high, so we will be cautiously optimistic. Uh, as at the end of last week, um, folks in, in, at the national headquarters of FEMA um, acquiesced to the to the fact that perhaps they have some responsibility in helping fund uh, debris removal from rivers. Uh, thanks to Tropical Storm Irene. Uh, to say more than that, I think, would be uh, probably overstepping and, and overstating the issue. Uh, it simply opens a door that really had been closed to those of us who are in that boat and seeking those funds. Well, I agree. We don't overstate it, but I think it's important for the community to know that, uh, uh, Stuart, I believe you got a call from Senator Leahy Friday, his office. Yes, I did. And I got one back. from uh, Congressman Peter Welch Friday, and I hope people understand that uh, this is not a dead issue with our congressional delegation. delegation. They are still working this. Uh, we got correspondence from uh, the Agency of Natural Resources today from Sue Minter, that the state's still working on this. And uh, this just the conversation I got with Congressman Welch was uh, part of the reversal of their, or the softening of their position was the work that we've already submitted. They've taken a hard look at what we've done because his comment was uh, Town of Bennington needs to be congratulated on the work they put down there. So it did have an impact on all the hard work we put in there. So uh, we paid off some of that loan with this warrant this time. Uh, we're really down to the debris removal. And we're down to there. So we're, we're chipping away. So when our 
our friends out there say we're not uh, uh, thinking about what's costing us. We are working that down, and hopefully, uh, with a little luck, we'll get it down to zero here soon. Do we know what's the amount we're at right now? Uh, we are looking for about three point nine million dollars. For, to be eligible, which would be 90% or 95% funding of that uh, by state and federal agencies. Okay. Uh, with that, <coughs> we'll go into executive session. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? And we'll go into executive session.